Me too, because this one has a really short chord. Um, today, I would like for us to stand if we could, and I'm just going to have to put this thing out of the way. Uh, stand if we could for the reading of God's Word in reverence for what it means. But let's, let's really take it in. Let's really take it in because this message, I think, is something I know God put on my heart and has been building in me for about a month. So I was not shocked when Pastor David asked if I would come and share today because God has, has really been working in me. Um, this message, for me, but also you can guarantee that if God is pushing something in your heart, it's because you're supposed to share it with somebody. It might not be at the pulpit. It might be at work. But if he's pushing something into your heart and impressing and making an impression on your heart, a given message, you're supposed to share it with somebody. So let's look at God's word today. Um, we're going to read from Isaiah 54. The Lord God has given me the tongue of a teacher that I may know how to sustain the weary with a word. Sustain the weary. He doesn't just give us that word to shape us, to build us, to change us. It's so that we can shape somebody else around us, lift somebody up, else up around us that is weary. We're around weary people. These are weary times. Continuing on, it says, to sustain the weary with a word, morning by morning, he wakens wakens my ear to listen as those as those who are taught disciples he wakens us say wake up oh that's weak wake up, wake up. we got to wake up think about this just coming to church we're getting back in the in the swing of things or some of us are going back to work for the first time and it's so easy to get caught up in just a sense of nothingness because we're not sure how to act, what to do, how to feel, whether to shake a hand, whether to hug somebody, whether to give a positive word. Are they ready to receive it? Well, I don't know. They're, they're kind of worried about this virus thing, but we can't worry about that. It doesn't matter. God gives us. He awakens us, and it's our job to help those around us stay awake. Today, God is wanting us to experience an awakening throughout time. It's so funny. Uh, it's, it's not funny. It's no coincidence at all that you guys chose that third song, talking about generation after generation and after generation, because that, that's part of today's message, and we didn't even talk about that, um, is the fact that, you know, this cyc cyclical thing we call time, that we call history, it... It, it is just continually moving like a wave. And after every single tragedy, after every single downfall, it's immediately followed by a great awakening. We are awakened. Even something that is so small in the shape of time, like the death of somebody we care about, even that leads to awakening because of the ways that they touched us and poured into us and the lessons that they have taught us. So, again, let's read this again, but with a new understanding of what is meant. We are disciples. We are being led. We are being changed through the awakening of God, if we receive it. We are not truly awakened if it does not change the way that we act about those around us. So let's read it one more time. The Lord God has given me the tongue of a teacher. All of us are teachers. We're teaching our children. If we're walking the right walk, we're teaching the people around us at work. We're teachers. He's given me the tongue of a teacher that I may sustain the weary with a word. Morning by morning, he awakens me. He awakens me. I just have to make sure that my ears are open to what he's teaching me. All right, sit down. We'll get into this thing. Wake up. You notice how, this is kind of awkward, isn't it? You notice how the old timers, when you sit around on this thing called a porch, they used to talk about the good old days, the good old days. 
And, and now that we're getting older, as, as, as we get up into our 30s and stuff like that, we, we started kind of talking about, that's not funny. With our kids to the way they were when we were kids. We wouldn't have got by with that. We would have got a spanking. We wouldn't have got by with that. So we have also started comparing um, in our age things to when we were a kid. And sometimes you ever get locked into thinking, well, is that because things are really that much different? Or is it really just a cycle? Is there something bigger going on? There's something bigger going on. It's the generations are occurring, but we get caught in our lifespan, our generation. We, we have become so far removed that we're not thinking about the future generations as deeply as we should. Deep enough that we're awakened to what God is trying to teach us to speak in them. Deep enough that we can take what God is putting in our hearts and teaching us from the previous generations. So what we're really experiencing is this cyclical thing called time. Since the first sin, time has been moving. And, and it's been you know, changing and shaping, but one thing that has not changed is the nature of the cycle. You got it. Sorry, you all. We had uh, technical difficulties, but we'll be good. So this, this cycle has been, you know, society starts to backslide. They're close to God. They start to backslide. Things start happening, and next thing you know, it leads to rebellion. Next thing you know, there are signs. There, in the Bible, there are signs from the prophets. There are signs from the previous generations that went before them, the history. They could learn that they didn't. And so it leads to catastrophe. It leads to tragedy. And then what does God do? Because this is a huge lesson. He's continually pursuing us. Because he loves us, he's continually pursuing us. He delivers the people. And the people then, well, no, no choice, God. I guess we'll return to you. But how long does it last? It's been going on since the beginning of the time. And that is not going to change until he comes back. It's going to continue to go on. So why be shocked with it? Why be surprised with it? Why even, you know, really study anything other than the fact that that's going to go on from time and time, and generation to generation? It's going to continue. So let's, let's, let's focus on what's important. We know that that's going to happen. This cyclical nature is going to continue. So it's what do we do about it? Well, we have to learn how our mind works. We have to rely on the correct source of information. Even our human psyche works in cyclical patterns. Let's throw a little psychology in it, Jeff. It's history last time, but it's psychology this time. Um, Layering. All right, click. Go ahead. Okay, so I'm going to get to some history, though. Um, the way the mind works, my grandson Malachi, when we had a hurricane baby about a year ago, um, his sister was born in Charleston in the middle of a hurricane. I managed to, by the grace of God, make it back with Malachi and get him here and get back before all the roads were shut down. Um, but Malachi, he was a grandpappy's boy. We could sit in the hospital room in Charleston and FaceTime back home, and you could show him a FaceTime of his mom, and he's just like, okay, that's good. But you flip that thing around and show him Poppy, he would go nuts. And there was this thing about cards. I could, you know, just... Um, shuffle the deck of cards, and, and he would explode. And, and you could tell that his mom, she was just ripped. She was torn over it. And, you know, inside, I'm like, yeah. But now, he screams when he sees me coming. When he sees her coming, or when he sees her go, he starts screaming. Um, so a child's mind works in cycles. Their favorite changes as time goes on. And you can guarantee that if you were his favorite once, you're going to be his favorite again. Because even our minds are cyclical. Think about the grieving process. All the things that we go through in our mind to grieve for somebody that we love and we care for, as, you know, as that goes on, we think that we're over that. We think that we've moved on. And then something happens that triggers how they smell. 
you hear their voice. You, you actually feel, not just remember, but you actually feel feelings that you felt when you were around that person. Then you feel guilty because you don't feel that anymore. Because it's so rare that you have those feelings. Well, that's a deeper, that emotion is pulled from something that's even deeper inside of our psyche that, that comes only when we see something that had a great impact on us. So there's different layers of, of, of this memory. Things that we just kind of remember and things that dealt with our desires like Malachi and that food that I could reach out of the cabinet for him and things that really jeer us inside because they made a huge impact on us. Okay? But after these tragedies that we go through in this cycle, that's when the awakening happens. So, thinking back to World War I, a little bit more history, thinking back to World War I to get into that war, you know, the Lusitania is sunk, sunk, and we get involved in that war, and directly after that war, the result of it, on the other side of it, was an awakening. Our economy started to do better. People treated people differently. But the big thing is the United States comes out of that. This is out of the Philadelphia Press on top of the world. For the first time, we're seen as a world power. All right, go ahead. So then what happens after that? Stock market crashes, the dust bowl. We go into a depression. Just as the depression starts to, to kind of subside, there are the effects of the, of the depression. We go into a recession. For sale, children, you ever think about doing that? But so you've got this recession that takes place and then a chain reaction. What happens directly after that? Go ahead, World War II. So point here being taken is in this cycle of time, we can learn a lot from history because the direct result of World War I for the United States was a stronger country that led to us being seen as a world power, which means that we have more respect but also more responsibility. But then, look, you have next, following that, even though it's a great time, you have these three major effects that take place in a chain reaction, an even deeper tragedy. But one thing we can be sure of is that on the other side of a larger tragedy, the deeper the tragedy, the deeper the tragedy, the deeper the awakening. What can we gather from this as we get ready to get into the Word is time is cyclical. There are things that we can do to learn to wake up so that we can really feel what God is trying to teach us based on what has already happened. Because He loves us and He don't want us to make those same mistakes over and over again, but He knows we're going to. So He's already prepared a way. So generation after generation, the best thing that we can do is wake up. Wake up. Take in the fact that life is cyclical. Don't be surprised by the fact that these bad things are going to happen. These negative things are going to happen. These challenges are going to happen. But what matters is, in our little sliver of time, how do we handle it? Are we just going through it? Are we growing through it? Because we're receiving what he is teaching. The greatest teacher is teaching. All right, let's look at Psalm uh, look into Psalm 145, 18 real quick and read that. What does it say? The Lord is near to all who call him, who call in truth. The Lord is near. That's the ticket. How do we wake up? We have to learn to draw near to God. It's not something we just wake up and we do. We have to learn to draw near to God. All right? We have to learn to lock it in. Everybody say, lock it in. Lock it in. We have to learn to lock it in. Secrets here. We'll get there. So, learn to lock it in. But also, in James, go ahead and click. Oh, not that far. Man, a little way. So, in James, submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will... He'll draw near to you. So the secret in it is to waking up is how do we draw near to God? How do, we, how do we grow closer? How do we recognize these cycles? Okay? Now, just a little bit more on how the mind works so that what I'm about to share with you out of the book of Amos, which is where we're going to spend most of our time, how this works. 
Um, layering of the mind. Um, we already saw it. Go ahead and pop it up. Yell out, what's the first thing you think of when you see these two pictures together? All right, it means something a little different for everybody. To me, it means Sunday school. When I was a little kid, that was a cheap snack. I went to Hilltop Baptist Church, so Kool-Aid, 10 cents, you know, animal crackers, pretty cheap too, so it, it automatically carries that. But that's just a memory, right? Hey, I don't really remember any deep feelings that is associated with that. Click one more. Now, this deals with our desires and our wants, so it's going to be a little bit different. It's going to be a deeper level. Go ahead and click one time. Oh, G&H green stamps. You old enough to remember these? Now, this triggers some actual emotion for me when I saw it, when I was looking up the pictures for it. The reason, though, because of my mom. It wasn't because of a desire of what I wanted to get out of that book. That, that'll come in the 1980s. But in the 1970s, seeing her with that green book and those stamps, I looked so forward to seeing her both order stuff and put those books together and look through them for stuff because my mom never got anything for herself. So it was a desire for me on her behalf to see her blessed. So when I see this, it triggers something a little deeper because it deals with desires and emotions. All right, click one more time. Now, this is me personally, 1980s, a service merchandise catalog. I remember that same catalog. Now, take just a minute. Look at that 400-pound TV, $400. Okay? 700-pound VCR, that's what that thing under the TV is, $630. Who could afford this stuff? I mean, we think how expensive a TV is today. I mean, this is in the 1980s, for goodness sakes. But still, me personally, there were things I wanted in that. So when I'm reminded of it, it triggers something deep. That's on a different level. But now we're about to get real. Remember how I said in this cycle, there are certain things in the psyche that hit us so hard and so strong that it makes us want to never, ever, ever forget it. We want to walk every day awakened. You hear what I'm saying? Awakened. Because it, it touches us at the core. Because it is what we are about. Click it. Totally different mood, is it not? We just went from jovial to in awe. How do we keep that? How do we wake up to this? Amos is trying to teach us. We can look into Amos and he's trying to teach you. You see, the last... You can go ahead and click. The last 12 books of the Old Testament. Go again. You're going backwards. <laughs> so the last 12 books, it should be a map. The last 12 books of the Old Testament are the 12 books of the Minor Prophets. Amos being one of these. Now Amos, there we go. Click it one more time. Amos is, there we go. He's a prophet that is trying to warn, just like the other prophets, of what is yet to come. Because if people are not learning from all the blessings that God has poured before their feet in the past, and they've reached in that cycle the point of near rebellion. Okay? They've been backsliding and backsliding, and they're into rebellion. But to understand what the story in Amos, we need to get just a little bit of geography and history. What you're looking at right there, the upper part is the northern kingdom, the bottom part the southern kingdom, that were all one kingdom that David built. David built. But it was split in half. Okay? Because the people were in rebellion and they had not learned what God had put before them to learn. They had not learned from the past. They had not learned to be awakened. They had been through awakenings. Generation after generation after generation, but they had not held on to it. So, let's get into the history of it. How did this thing break up? We have to look back to 1 Kings 12. Now, I'm going to read a little lengthy section here for you. Rehoboam went to Shechem. For all Israel had come to Shechem to make him king. When, Re when Jeroboam, son of Nebat, heard of it, for, you know, he had been chased away by Solomon, Rehoboam's father. Then Jeroboam returned from Egypt. And they sent and called him and Jeroboam. And all the assembly of Israel came and said, Rehoboam, your father has made our yoke heavy. Now, therefore, lighten this hard service of your father and his heavy yoke that he placed on us and we'll serve you. 
So he looks at him. He said, go away for three days. Give me some time to think over this. So the people went away. Then King Rehoboam took counsel with the elder men who had attended his father Solomon while he was still alive, saying, How do you advise me to answer these people? They answered him, If you will be a servant to this people today and serve them, the servant, the king, to serve them, and speak good words to them when you answer them, the way that we deliver words. Then they will be your servants forever. But he disregarded the advice of the the elders who gave them to him and consulted with the young men who had grown up around him and now attended him. That's a big problem, refusing the advice of those who had been down the road, who had concerns over the generations, and just taking in what you want to hear. If somebody's saying something that, that you like, it's easy just to listen to them instead of listening to the advice of the elders. Um, now, why is this such a big deal in the story, though? Well, if we flick, flip on back to Deuteronomy, uh, the laws passed down to Moses in, in 17.8 say, If a judicial decision is too difficult for you to make between one kind of bloodshed and another, one kind of legal right and another, or one kind of assault and another, any such matters of your dispute in your towns, then you shall immediately go up to the place that the Lord your God will choose, where you shall consult with the Levitical priest and the, and the judge who is in offense in those days, and shall announce to you the decision in this case. Well, he had directly ignored the lessons of the previous generation, so the cycle continues, failures continue, but one thing we can be sure of is that on the other side of it, there's opportunity for awakening if we're receptive to it. But nonetheless, they weren't receptive to it, so there's a great rebellion. The kingdom is split into two. All right, go ahead. Keep going, keep going, keep going. All right, one more. So here's what happens. Amos is living just south of that red line. This is the division between the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. He is just southwest of Bethel. Well, God gives him a very tough task to do. That task is to travel to Bethel and deliver a message that nobody wants to hear. You ever try to tell something, speak life into somebody, and they just don't want to hear it? Well, we do. We preach it anyway. That's what Amos did. He goes to Bethel and he preaches these messages. Here's, let me give you a little sneak peek of, of what Amos is telling the people. Uh, I'm reading out of Amos 5.11. Therefore, because you trample on the poor and take from them levies of grain, you have built houses of hewn stone, but you shall not live in them. You have planted pleasant vineyards, but you shall not drink of their wine. For I know how many are your transgressions, and I know how great are your sins. You who afflict the righteous, who take the bribe and push aside the needy and the gate. There's a great disconnect here. The people of God were going to worship, and then they walk out the door, and they do nothing to show evidence that God is at work in their heart. They were not understanding what was going on with this cycle. We can't fix what's going on in the cycle until we recognize that we are in the hamster wheel. We cannot do anything other than what God leads us to do to affect those around us in the hamster wheel because the wheel's not going to stop spinning. We have to connect and learn from the past generations so that we have something to give the future generations to help them move in the right direction so that we are awakened to God, knowing that the only thing that's going to end this is when Jesus comes. And until then, how can we be awakened so we can have a good effect on those around us? That's so important. All right, so what happens for Amos? When the story with Amos, he's going and preaching this message, and the problem is the people become complacent. They're farther along than that backsliding thing, okay? They're in flat-out rebellion. And today, theologians call this libertine antinomianism. Anti meaning against, nomian meaning law. 
This exists today. This, the reason that this term was, was, came about by theologians today is because it refers to people today that have the same nature as people back then in this cycle. What, what am I talking about back then? They become complacent. They had seen what God had done. They had been part of it. They had experienced awakening. They had experienced return to God. But now they're also experiencing the backsliding. They're experiencing the rebellion. So what, what is this? Antinomian. They believe that, that they have this sense of freedom because they're not under the law anymore, just under grace. And they've got good firepower. Go ahead and click. They've got good firepower. The firepower is Romans 6, 14. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. It is so easy to grab a single verse and twist it to mean anything we want it to mean. You're going through something tough, so let me, let me just look for the verse that can help me to justify my sin. Been there, done it? Yep, me too. But here's the problem. Let me read for you. Go ahead and click Romans 6, 1 through 13, because this is what the L.A.s are forgetting. What then are we to say? Should we continue in our sin in order that grace may abound? By no means. That's all we need right there. But I'll continue. By no means. How can we who died to sin go on living in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him by baptism into death so that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in the newness of life. So just, just to clear up, the problem with the L.A., which back then we just, the Scripture calls those who have kind of fallen asleep at the wheel, um, we are covered by grace. But if we continue to allow ourselves that, to sin, not that we can stop it, it's the wheel, Right? Jesus hadn't come yet. The wheel's still going to spin, but we have to fight daily. We have to learn to wake up. We've got to learn to wake up and connect with him so that we do not fall victim to these same things. So, um, this cycle, where are we in this cycle? As a society, where are we at? Um, you know, there are a lot of scriptural references that give clue as to what will happen, not just in the end times, but during times of rebellion. And if you read the qualifiers, which I'll do in a few seconds, so I have a couple of different uh, chunks of scripture, um, you have to kind of be curious. Where, where are we at today? Where, where are we at? Um, but look, let's go back to Amos for a second. Go ahead and click to the next one. Here's the problem. In Amos 1 through 3, Amos then goes on to teach the people about the judgment that's coming. Because God's going to give you a wake-up call. And here's the thing. So the Israelites, they're sitting there in Bethel. They're listening to him preach and teach on what's to come. Go ahead and click one more time. And, and Amos tells the people, okay, well, eat them. Judah, even Judah, Philistia, Gaza, um, they've been sinned against God, and judgment's coming. And the Israelites are sitting back going, yeah, all right, bring it to them. They've caused us nothing but problems. This is, this is okay. But then Amos goes on. Click again. You starting to see the picture? Tyre, Ammon, Moab, these are all going to be judged against by God. And the Israelites are sitting back going, yeah, okay, bring it to them, bring it to them. Because they're in their complacency. Okay, they're God's people. God's delivered them. But they're living a complacent lifestyle, what we today call the L.A., right? Now, one more click. Who's in the crosshairs? Holy cow. God's people is in the crosshairs. Why is the focus on God's people? I mean, this is a message that Amos has given them. So how do you think the people felt? They're, they're, they're saying, yeah, give it to them, give it to them, give it to them. But the minute the crosshairs are on them, what? Get out of here, Amos. 
They can't believe it. They've fallen asleep at the wheel. They're complacent. They, they're no longer experiencing that awakening. All right, let's go ahead. How do we get rid of this? What do we do about it? Where are we as a society? How, how do we adjust to this? What do we do? How do we wake up? Again, say lock it in. Oh, y'all about to fall asleep right now. Lock it in. That's the secret. Lock it in. The secret is lock it in. Let's see if this thing works. Wade gave it to me. I don't know if it works or not. It says on. I had to get another guy a few minutes ago to show me how to turn the volume up. It says loudness. I'm not used to seeing them. You see them volume. Oh, you hear that? That's annoying, isn't it? If you're driving down the road and you hear that, what are you going to do? Today, you just push a button and go to auto seek, right? But back in, back in our day, you had to kind of... Oh, there's something right there. I'm getting a little something. Are you going to drive around listening to that, though? We want to lock it in. We don't want to listen to that. But that's the way we live our Christian lives. We, we drive down the road, so to speak, figuratively, and our channel's not locked in. There's a disconnect. And I'm speaking as much for myself as anybody, but there's a huge disconnect when we leave church on Sunday because of life. And, and everybody's different. For some people, it's because they're just a flat-out heathen. That's, that's between them and the Lord. But for me, and for you, it might just be that we get bombarded with life when we get out there. But the problem is, what do we have to offer the future generations to make them aware of this cyclical nature of time, to get them to understand that it's not about trying to change what we can't control. It's about how do I do my part to prepare the next generation, to learn from the previous generation so that I can learn to lock it in. And when I say lock it in, I'm talking about my relationship with God. I don't want to drive around listening to that because what God has in mind for me, come on, Lord. Give me a good station. Hey, it's Wade's radio. You get the picture. We want, we want to lock it in. We want that station to be, I'm so ADD, I just wanted to stay there with it until I found it. But, but anyway, ADD, ADHD, whatever. I'm a teacher, I don't know. So, so, you know, we need to find a way to lock it in. And there are tools that God gives us that teach us what we need to do to be able to lock in that relationship with him so that we can live life truly awakened. Don't you want to live a life where you are awakened by his power and his presence? Because let me tell you something. There is nothing that is more awesome and meaningful than going to work one day and having somebody come up to you and say, hey, can you help me through something? And then you, you kind of have this moment where you're doing a self-check and you're like, wait a minute. Somebody's coming to me? Well, they must have seen something in me that I don't see. What's happening? You've been awakened to the truth. You've learned through the sanctification process what it means to try to lock it in. To draw from God what he is trying to speak through and to you. How do we live like that? Well... He gives us directions. <laughs> Go ahead and click to the next one. Lock it in. Well, first of all, why do we need to lock it in? Because God is so good. God is so good. Hey, just for fun, I'm going to read a couple. My mom, she was big on music, and, and her sisters, they used to go around singing all the time at different churches, and I was too young to remember, but my sister does because she's a lot older than me. But uh, I want to read a couple of songs out to you, song titles, and you scream out, well, you know, loud enough I can hear you. The correct version of this song. Amazing, great, how neat, grace, how neat the sound. Oh, it's sweet. It's not neat. Be thou my hobby. V 
vision, be that my vision, what am I seeing? I'm fairly certain my Redeemer lives. I know my Redeemer lives. I surrender some. I surrender it all. Joyful, joyful. We kind of like thee. We adore thee. Those would be song titles in a lukewarm church hymnal. Okay? If we're locked in, if we are awakened, all we can do is be amazed. All we can do is stand in awe. Let me share some verses with you. Ephesians 6. Don't try to uh, flip through these because this is going to be pretty quick. Ephesians 6. Be strong in the Lord and his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can stand against the devil's schemes. Jeremiah 23 says, Am I only a God nearby, declares the Lord, not far away? Who can hide in secret places? Do not I feel heaven and earth? 1 Thessalonians 5, 17. Pray without ceasing. Somebody say, lock it in. in. Psalm 73. But as for me, it is good to be near God. I have made the sovereign Lord my refuge. And of course, again, we say James 4, 8. Draw near to him and he will. But I urge you, you are as close to God as you want to be. I say that quite often, mostly to myself. You are as close to God as you want to be. What does that mean? We've got to lock it in. We can't drive around on half static. We've got to learn to lock it in. Why else? Go ahead. Okay. John, we're going to look at 1613. He, why? Because he will be our guide when the spirit of truth comes. The spirit of truth being the Holy Spirit. He will guide you into all the truth. I want to know the truth. I'm not capable of knowing the truth by myself. I need God to reveal it to me through the Holy Spirit. For he will not speak on his own. The Holy Spirit's not going to speak on his own. Who's delivering the message here? He's locked into God. He's my intercessor. He is telling me what God wants me to know. Go ahead and click again, continuing on on 1613, because he would declare and reveal to me things yet to come. Now, is that just talking about seeing into the future? Well, it can be, but it could also be in making decisions. You need help making decisions? Turn to the Word, because it continues and says, and he will declare to you things that are yet to come. Go ahead and click again. More proof in Nehemiah 18. Then he said to them, go your way, Eat the fat, drink the sweet, and send portions to those from whom nothing is prepared, to the needy. For this day is the day of our holy Lord. Do not sorrow, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. He will not allow us to face discouragement alone ever again. Does that mean we don't face tough times? No. But he gives us what we need so that we don't have to feel that. How can we possibly, if we're in awe of God, if we're not singing from this songbook, if we're singing from the right songbook, it does not take us long to forget that we're spinning in that hamster wheel, but we've been awakened, and we're learning how to keep it locked in so we can't help but to remember Nehemiah 18. The Lord is my strength. I don't want to face discouragement by myself. What a peace of mind this is. Go ahead and click. And lastly, he will provide everything you need. Matthew 6, 33. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. The story of Amos is so strong. Go ahead and click. Because if we learn from it, we learn to recognize the things that God puts before us to recognize out of his love, out of his grace, out of his mercy, out of his heart that he's pouring into us. He's impressing on our hearts. I believe it's in 2 Corinthians where he, it's one of my favorite verses, I think it's 3-2, where he, you know, is specifically saying that these things are not written on human tablets or on uh, tablets They're written on human hearts. These words, these things that God is impressing on us, the story of Jesus Christ is impressed on our hearts, written in my heart from the time that I accepted Jesus. It is written on my heart. I carry it with me. That's an impression. 
That's one of those things kind of like the cross when, I, when we flash that picture of that solemnness you got. When I think about 2 Corinthians 3, 2, I, I'm, I'm just in awe because of what God is doing. But how do we recognize this cycle? Where are we today? Let's look real quick at a couple of scriptures in James 4. That was right. Um, first of all, friendship with the world. What the Word says is those conflicts and disputes among you... Where do they come from? Do they not come from your cravings that are at war within you? You want something, and you do not have it, so you commit murder. You covet something and cannot obtain it, so you engage in disputes and conflicts. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and you do not receive, but because you ask wrongly. In order to spend what you get, on your pleasures. There's a big difference between that second set of pictures that I put up a few minutes ago when we were talking about mental imaging. Remember the picture of the service merchandise catalog and the GNH catalog? Those two catalogs, we remembered them. And we remember maybe even some experiences we had with them, but it's a totally different effect than when we looked at that picture of the thorn, crown of thorns and the blood and the spikes. Totally different effect. All right. Uh, flipping back real quick. Uh, out of Second Timothy. If we really want to ask ourselves, where are we at in this cycle? We don't need to look anywhere else but Second Timothy. It tells us. Here we go. Second Timothy 3. You must understand this, that in the last days, distressing times will come, for people will be lovers of themselves. Selfie. Lovers of money, hard to give things up, boasters, focused on self, arrogant, focused on self, abusive, because we don't have a true sense of identity that can only be found in Jesus, disobedient to their parents, because everybody else does it, ungrateful, holy, inhuman, incapable, slanderers, Brutes, haters of good, treacherous, reckless, swollen in conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. I could go on and on. I don't know the answers. But when we look at what Scripture says in both of these areas, we, we have to ask, where are we? And I dare say that we need to look inside as well and say, why are we seeking an answer to that question? Is it because we're involved in... in wanting to know the gritty details of the truths that, that are going on around us because we, we just want to see the drama unfold? Are we seeking answers so that we can put them to good use because we're learning to become awakened so that we can have an effect on somebody around us, so that we can help our children make better decisions, so that we can model being a better parent in front of them so that they know what to do when they become a parent. And when we have it, and I dare say that I'm, I'd be one of those, all we can do is ask for grace and mercy and another chance to show what we've learned from what God has led us through through our awakenings. So wake up and learn to lock it in. All right, go ahead and click again. There are tools that God gives us. And these are just some tools that, you know, that I would like to share with you, not that I came up with, but that I've learned over the years from people that have poured into me. Um, Self-discipline, which I was definitely not born with, but I have I've worked uh, by the grace of God to learn from some people that I really respect that God's put in my life um, and these are some things that you can do because we're, what we're talking about here, let's make clear again. We're talking about how do we lock it in? How do we stop being complacent? How do we stop being looking more like a L.A.? How do we quit making our songbook look like that songbook? We have to learn tools. Here are some tools. They all revolve around self-discipline. And we know a lot of Scripture revolves around self-discipline. All right, go ahead, click it. Just to remind myself, prayer targets. Now, prayer is a tough thing. Prayer is a tough thing. There's no wrong way to pray. If, if you struggle to pray, even if you don't struggle to pray and you like this idea, it is a very powerful tool. Every week, maybe once a month, I don't know, whatever works for you. 
Prayer targets. Make a prayer target. I literally make mine and have kind of modeled to my, to my kids through a Bible study that we haven't been doing like we used to, is you make a prayer target. At the center has to be God. You, you write specific things that you want to pray to God because you adore Him and because you love Him. And it shouldn't just be focused on, God, give me this, give me that. It should be focused on, I adore you, I love you, I'm thankful to you. I commit myself to you. Just simple things. Then the next dream, things for your family. You know somebody's going through something, specifically write down what to pray for them. Don't pray it the same way every day. The, the fewer words that you have in that prayer target, the better, because then you're not going to be praying it like the Lord's Prayer, where you just say it because you've said it, and you've heard it, and you've heard it, and you've said it. You're thinking about it. You're meaning it. You're locked in. You are awakened. Um, prayer targets are really good. You can add a third ring where you're praying for other people. You can add another ring on the outside where you're praying for things that are worldly, global, our leaders, people that, that, that are around the world. Uh, click the next one. Journaling. Every time I bring this up, you, there's always somebody that comes up afterwards. They say, so you keep a diary. No, it's not a diary. Journaling means I'm studying the Word. I pick a time daily to study the Word. As I study, I write what God reveals to me. I write what, what I'm learning, but also what God reveals to me. And if we're, the more in tune we are, we actually learn from God. He will speak to us. He will speak to our hearts. He will imprint messages on our hearts. And we need to write them down because if we're not writing them down, we don't have any proof. We go, remember what we said about the mind? It's going to cycle. In two months, we're not going to remember what we thought, even if it's something that God revealed to us. But if we write it, we go back and read it, and then we have something that triggers our memory. We're holding on to it. We're awakened. We're touched by it. Touched by it enough that we want to remember it and we want to see Kim. All right, next. To go verses. This is something that was brought up, uh, introduced to me from a teacher buddy several years ago, and it is awesome. I'm not a great memorizer of anything, but there is great power, and God will use it in taking something like index cards or sticky notes, and you write three, four, five, six verses on it, and you literally carry them with you all week. Every chance you get, pray without ceasing, okay? Pray without ceasing. You take them out, and you read them. You think about how... how how does this apply to my life? How can I use this today? But you should not be shocked. Get ready. Because what's going to happen is the people that are around you, when they come up and ask you about something, you got something that means something to share with them and not your own opinion. And your opinion is going to become more and more to be shaped by those words that you're studying and reading every day, and you're going to get more locked in. You're going to become awakened. And suddenly you find yourself not worrying about the stuff you used to worry about because there's peace in it. Carry those things around with you. I mean, when, when you finish carrying them around for a week, don't, don't throw them away. Keep them. Spread them out on the table. Spread them out on a desk or something. Go pick them up because you're going to need them when people come to you. All right, go again. A weekly message to share. Same teacher shared this with me. Um, as you're studying, a lot of times we find that there's a certain thing, a certain, you know, big picture that, that God is revealing to us. Find one person every day to share that with. If, if that story hasn't developed in you yet through your studies, use one of those verses. But purposefully find at least one person, a different person, every day to just simply share. And that doesn't mean go press it on and say, hey, listen, you're going to sit down and listen to this. Say, hey, you know what, I, what has touched my heart today? You know what touched my heart this week? Here's something God's revealed to me. I just want to share it with you. Two minutes. Share it with them. All right, click it again. Serve. Get involved and serve. That goes without being said. We know that. Not because we're doing works, but because we're being touched by God, and this is the fruit. All right, click again. Now, Acts, these are, these are prayer tips. Uh, I learned about Acts from doing a Bible study with my family a long time ago that came from uh, that movie. Help me out. What's the movie? 
Prayer, war room. Yeah, war room. We did the Bible study together, and this is just a way of prayer that was brought out in that Bible study, and it just stuck with me, and, and I use it all the time, usually in the shower. And what that stands for is adoration. So, Lord, I adore you. And so your first thing out of your mouth is just words of adorations and how in awe you are of him. C stands for confession. Then confess anything you need to confess to him. T, thank you. Thank you for forgiving me of my sins. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for showing me grace and mercy when I don't deserve it. And supplication. Not just for our needs, Anybody's needs around us. There are always people we need to pray for that are in need. Uh, Pace, I actually found out about at the last men's group conference that we went to. That's one of the main things that I pulled from that conference. I thought, holy cow, when I, when I throw Acts and Pace together, I mean, that's a good 15 minutes of prayer. And it changes every time because you're not writing the exact words out. You've just got something stuck in your mind because you're trying to stay locked in. And what that teaches you is to focus on praying more meaningful prayers to God. But it's so simple. What does pace stand for? God, I praise you. Kind of sounds like the beginning of the last one. But here's where it gets really different. And he suggested doing it with hand motions. God, I accept you. And he uses the hand motions. I know it looks weird. and It's kind of like doing a youth dance. But it's really powerful. I accept you. Okay? I commit myself to you. He said, push out. I commit myself to you. And God, I embrace you. Now, it does feel a little weird in the shower the first time you do that embrace you part. But believe me, it's such a powerful way to pray. God, I adore you. I confess myself before you. I'm thankful. I know you're going to provide the needs, God. God, I praise you. I accept you. I commit myself to you. I embrace you. Sometimes you just need to say the words because God knows what's in the heart behind it. These are tools to help us lock it in because as as we go through life, we continually want to feel at peace. We want to feel at peace. We have the tools before us to do it. We just have to recognize the cycle. We have to lock it in. But also, we have to retrain our brain to see forgiveness, mercy, and grace in a new way. Why? Well, here's a very powerful verse to tell us why. 1 John 1.10. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar. Him, God, a liar. And the word is not in us. That's humbling. That's humbling. So, today, what I hope that God has spoken into you is what he's been speaking into me for the past month, since the last Wednesday night that I was asked. That's kind of when this message started to develop. God has been telling me to wake up. Now, God has blessed me with many opportunities for awakenings, but I'm not holding on to them like I should. I'm not locking it in like I should. Now, my big problem is I wake up in the morning. I'm pretty good about waking up. But sometimes I make it more about my studies than my prayer life. Well, there's a problem with the balance there. I'm not locked in. That's static. Because if I know every word of the Bible, that's a good thing. But it's not as good as having a strong connection where I'm locked in with God so that he can teach me and grow me through what I'm reading and studying. We have to be careful, locked in, aware and locked in. And I hope that's what what God will do for you as we go through the next week. Now, I want to do something a little bit different to wrap up. You can go ahead and come up if you want to. I want to do something a little bit different to wrap up and... The nature of what we're going to do, could we turn this off for a second? 